praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak, so that you may also know how I am and what I'm doing. Uh, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister of the Lord, will tell you everything. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Would you pray with me this morning for our time in the Word together? Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity that we can gather freely and safely um, to study your Word. God, I pray that you would uh, be with me this morning as we venture through the rest of this. I know um, it, it's, it's been a long five months that we've been in the book of Ephesians, and so, Lord, I, I pray that these truths that we have studied um, for the last almost half a year, would root deeply in our hearts, um, and it would lead us to praise and worship um, and unity because of what we have in Christ. So be with us this morning, God. We love you. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I know that um, when it comes to texts like this morning, I don't know if, you're, if you guys have Bible reading plans, but you typically get to a letter like this, and you kind of see final greetings. You kind of skim over something. Maybe you'll see something super profound, I don't know. But typically, when we get to parts of biblical letters like this, we just read through it quickly and not think much of it, right? And some of you probably even wondered, I think someone asked me last week, oh, well, you're finishing the book this week, right? And I said, well, no, we're going to do the final greeting next week. And they were kind of like, oh, all right, good luck. Um, you know, and, and so I, I want to remember, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, this is the last letter we think that Paul wrote before he died, Paul instructs Timothy, who he's discipled, and Timothy's a younger pastor at the time. Um, Paul tells him, he says, you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which is the scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work, meaning all scripture is profitable, right? Right? They all, they, all, they all point to Jesus, even the goodbyes at the end of letters, right? It's, it's there. It's profitable for us. That's why in the very next sentence, when Paul keeps writing in this letter to Timothy, he then tells Timothy, he says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. And use the word for what it's good for, right? Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all com complete patience and teaching. And so my request for us this morning is for us to just look again at this passage, right? Look a little deeper here. Because in it, I think we actually do find a lot of really good instructions for our prayer lives. Um, for, I, I think we learn a lot of valuable lessons about ministry. And I think we'll really also even get in a process and an in insight into how Paul processes his pain and his suffering as he's sitting in a jail cell writing this. Because um, what I love here, I think what we've seen throughout Ephesians, and if you read the book of Acts and, and you read other Pauline epistles, I think we'll see a lot of like, Paul, the theologian, missionary, church planter, right? Um, here we see Paul the pastor, Paul the friend, um, Paul the comrade. We, we see Paul the lover of people. We, we really get a look into his pastoral heart, and I, I think that when we actually understand what's going on in these verses, we learn a key insight into how, kind of how we shape, how we view God, how we view other people around us. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at these final seven verses of Ephesians. Um, it doesn't look like a lot, but we're going to start digging around, and I think we'll find three really incredible um, truths or exhortations or whatever you want to call them, three points if you're taking notes. Um, so we'll start with this one, verse 18. Verse 18, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. If you want to sum this up, we should pray constantly and pray comprehensively. 
Okay, notice, because in that one verse, he says the word all four times. If you circle or underline or highlight in your Bibles, just circle all the times he says all right there. All times in the Spirit, all prayer and supplication. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And, and what I love that Paul does is he's really amplifying prayer here, right? He does this in a number of ways. The first thing he says is, is pray at all times, which means we're to pray constantly, right? Everywhere, all the time, we are to pray. We should pray. Prayer isn't just a gift that some people receive, right? It's not just to think, well, those people are good at praying, so we'll let them pray, and I'll just sit here quietly. But no, it's, it's an obligation that we're all called to do. I mean, Jesus assumes this in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, when you pray, speaking to all the disciples, we're to pray continually, pray at every opportunity is what 1 Thessalonians 5 says. And, and Paul has shown the importance of prayer. Actually, here, this is, we, we kind of see a little prayer here at the end of Ephesians, but, but there's been two massive prayers so far in chapter 1 and chapter 3 that we've already studied. So we're to pray at all times. The second thing to note is that we're to pray in the Spirit. Now, this isn't necessarily praying in tongues. I don't think that's really what Paul's arguing here. Um, we can get into that conversation if we go through 1 Corinthians or you want to talk to me after service, but I don't think that's what he's arguing here because this is a continuation of the idea that we see in chapter 5, verse 18, where he says you're to live in the Spirit. And so he's saying, well, great, if you live in the Spirit, you walk in the Spirit, which he later argues, and then you pray in the Spirit. You pray in the Spirit. We're to pray in accordance with the Holy Spirit who guides us and empowers us as we pray. The next thing we see is that we're to pray with all prayer and supplication. Our prayers must be diligent. They must be diligent. Now, when Paul's saying prayer and supplication, he's not trying to put those in two different categories. He's trying to intensify what he's trying to say, right? He's not trying to distinguish, well, pray and, and do some supplication, right? He, he's just trying to emphasize faithful prayer, right? We pray all times about all things, right? And so he, he's showing the importance of believing prayer, expecting prayer, the prayers that we are supposed to pray. The next thing we see is it says to that end, keep alert. Keep alert. We're supposed to pray with alertness. Now, if you remember, this is a continuation of the sentence that came before it, right? Which, what was he talking about? He was talking about living in a spiritual battle, putting on our, our spiritual armor and engaging in this spiritual warfare. And so he says, okay, since we're in the, in the midst of this warfare, we are to stay vigilant. We're to stay alert. Now, when we think, he even says, keep alert, you have to think back to the garden where Jesus is with his disciples, and they're falling asleep, and Jesus encourages them, stay awake and pray. Could you not tarry for one hour? In light of what? In light of temptation, in light of the weakness of their flesh, in light of Jesus' impending death and then ultimately his return, we are to stay alert. Stay alert how? With all perseverance. With all perseverance, meaning that we're to persist in pray, not just pray when we feel like it. Right? We're just persist in prayer. It, it helps us overcome fatigue, right? Even when we're discouraged, even when we have hardship, even when we're dealing with news events that we don't know how to process. I'm like, the Psalm 13 was so formative for me this week, and how I processed a lot of my thoughts and emotions and prayers as I read a heartbreaking report and saw heartbreaking things on the news. Prayer is, is the way that we process these emotions, and praise the Lord that He's given us so many prayers and songs and scripture to help us do that. I mean, read the book of Acts. I mean, this type of prayer categorized the new church, and then lastly, we see we're to pray for all the saints with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Now, again, we got to remember the themes of this book are kind of coming to an end. Paul's wrapping the book up with a nice, pretty bow. Okay, so unity in the church has been a theme throughout the letter. And basically what he's saying is just pray for all the Christians. Well, which ones? All, all of them, everywhere, right? In all churches, all locations, all cultures, all situations, all languages, all heights, all ages, everything. We're to pray for all the Christians. And I think what this does actually is it starts with us growing in awareness that Christianity exists outside of our world, right? Like the gospel is being preached even in our city. I would even venture to say on this very street we're at, outside of this building, right? 
We need to grow in awareness that, that God's kingdom is much bigger than Grace Hewitt, right? Now, grant we're part of his kingdom, okay? Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to downplay this, but I want us to expand our view and, and, and grow this awareness outside of ourselves, right? We're to pray for all the saints. This is, we need to know the ability to be able to stand against the attacks of the devil. They require believers to pray for one another. They require for believers to, I mean, I, I was convicted even this week. I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with, you know, parenting toddlers really drives you to prayer, right? Right? More it's like, okay, Michael, don't get angry. Don't get, you know, and I'm like, no, I need to pray for my kids to have a heart, right? And for my wife to put up with me when I fail at that, right? Like, I, I need to look outward in my prayers too. Pray for all the saints, not just for yourself. Now, we, again, we got to remember the context. We're in this spiritual war, and so when Paul's telling us to pray comprehensively, when he's telling us to pray constantly, which means all the time about everything, we, we have to realize it's, yes, it, this is all the more important because of the battle we're in. Now, on that, I know a lot of us are driven to prayer when we realize the battle, right? When, when, when things get hard, you get marriage struggles, you, you feel attacks from the enemy, you, you have frustrations in parenting, whatever it is, Typically, I don't know if, it's, if, if you're like me, but when I'm driving around my car, that's when I just start praying. I'm like, oh, God, can you please fix this? Like, I know you're good. This is chaos. You bring order to chaos, so help me out here, right? And sometimes, outside of, you know, before meals or before bedtime, sometimes, if we're not careful, I think that's the only prayers that we might actually ever offer up to the Lord, Right? I'm not saying it's, it's, it's wrong to pray in those situations where we need the Lord. And in fact, sometimes I think the Lord puts us in sticky situations. I think he gives us toddlers sometimes to bring us to our knees, right? I think he puts us in certain places and in certain situations to draw us to prayer. But I think what Paul's saying here in verse 18 by using all so many times is that we're to pray in all situations. We're to pray in all situations, Meaning, if you're happy, like, express that happiness to God. If you're sorrowful, weep to the Lord, right? If, if you feel pain, if, if you're despondent, pray about that. Pray about the situations at work that you're like, I just can't wait to go vent to my spouse when I get home. Or I can't wait to tell my boss off whenever I finally quit. Like, th those things, like, pray to the Lord. Take that to Him, Right? As we think about, even when we're on vacation, even when we're with our friends enjoying amazing things. I remember one time in college, we were eating this terribly disgusting piece of greasy pizza, and my friend said, God, this will kind of supply our needs, but let it point us to the ultimate provision we have in you. And I'm just like, how did you get from pizza to the gospel, right? But, but he, he, he really saw all things as an avenue to pray. Right? All things as an avenue to pray. They should push us, and even for our enemies. Right? Even as I crafted that prayer and I spent hours this week processing through, how are we going to pray through some horrible things that have happened in this country? Yes, I pray for justice, but I'm also going to pray for mercy. Right? And, and it took a lot for me to, to get to a point in my prayer where I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm actually praying that the Lord would bring this person to repentance, or these people to repentance, because he did that to me. I, I, I don't want us to just make the mistake then of coming to God as if he's some genie, right, and we're just Aladdin who happened to find the thing, we get three wishes, we rub it, we tell him what we want, and when he's done, he goes back into the lamp, right? We don't want to have this Aladdin theology of God in prayer, right? We don't. We, we, we need to see different prayers of adoration, right? Which is just, God, this is who you are. I, not even thanksgiving, like thank you for all the great things you've given me. Yes, pray prayers of thanksgiving. Pray prayers of adoration. Pray prayers of confession. Pray prayers of intercession, right? So not only confessing our sins, but, but praying for those around us. Praying prayers of lament. And praying prayers of supplication. I think one author says there, there's no situation in life where prayer should be absent. No situation where it should be absent. We're to pray at all times, with all prayer and supplication, with all perseverance, for all the saints. Always. Everywhere. All the time. Always. All right? Now, that's not the end of the sentence. 
Paul goes on to ask for prayer for himself, which leads us to our second point, which is, I think we should pray for gospel ministers. Pray for gospel ministers. We see this in verse 19 to 22. Now, there's a lot in these three verses, four verses, um, but notice first, notice the first four, letter, four words of verse 19, and also for me, and also for me. Now, this is Paul, right? If, if you've read the book of Acts, or you've read his letters, or you know a little bit about Christianity, like this is one of the best theologian, missionary, church planter, pastors of all time, of all time. I mean, planted churches in so many cities, I'm like, planting one church is enough for me to just hang on my boots, right? This is Paul, and he comes, and, and he realizes, I don't have sufficient resources to communicate the gospel and do everything on my own, so I must call upon the saints to pray for me. I must. And on top of that, he, he's chained up in a prison cell in Roman captivity. And instead of feeling pity for himself or feeling resentment for where he is, notice he doesn't say and pray for me that, that God might break me free, which he's done before, right? God broke the jail out. And before, I mean, if I was Paul, I would have ran right out. But, but Paul said, actually, I'm going to go evangelize to the, to the, the guy who's, who's watching us in the prison, the, the guard. So he doesn't ask for prayer of escape. He doesn't wallow in self-pity. He doesn't have resentment. The prayer he asks for isn't release from prison. It's not deliverance. Instead, he's saying would you pray for me that, that I would be able to fully convey the gospel message in my present situation? Not get me out of prison, but no, no, no. I'm in prison here sovereignly by the hand of God. Pray that I would be faithful here. I'm suffering sovereignly by the hand of God. Pray that I would be faithful here. Pray that I would be faithful here. Like, he says, pray that I would be fearless and bold. Again, this is Paul, right? This is Paul, we, if, if there's anything we've seen from his gospel ministry, it's fearlessness and boldness. That's all we've seen all the time when it, when it comes to sharing the gospel. Paul's like, all right, well, you're going to stone me. Great. I'll be back tomorrow. Okay. You're going to put me in prison. Great. I'll just share the gospel with everyone here. Okay. You're going to kill me. All right, fine. To die is gain. They're like, fine, we'll leave you here. He's like, well, to live is Christ, right? This is, this is Paul, right? Paul just shows, I am fearless, I am bold, I am going to share the gospel wherever I go, yet he asks the believers, pray for me in that. Pray for me in that. Pray that the Lord would supply me with boldness. Even the boldest evangelist needs our prayers. Even if someone seems fearless, just don't go, well, they're fine. Go, no, no, God, pray that they stay fearless. Just as if we saw someone with a great marriage, we'd go, yeah, Lord, I pray that their marriage stays great, right? It's the same with evangelists. The point here is that we need to pray for others as they share the gospel. We've talked about this last week. Evangelism is spiritual warfare, and we need to support those that are in the battle. One of my favorite passages of all time, in Paul's writing specifically, um, at, at the end of 2 Timothy, Paul says this. It's another greeting, which I love. I would love to preach a sermon on this. Maybe one day we'll get there. This is what Paul says. He, he's talking about dying and dying alone and, and being at the edge of death, right? He says, at my first offense, no one came and stood by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me. He strengthened me so that through me, the, my, the message might be fully proclaimed to all the Gentiles might hear it. And so I was rescued from the lion's mouth. He was delivered from Satan, right? Not, not hardship, not the situation. He's delivered from Satan and the temptation to give up. I mean, when, when Paul evangelized, he was proclaiming Jesus where Christ was not named or known. And, and obviously, when, when we're doing mission work, when we're sharing the gospel with people that have never heard of the gospel before, there's nothing more than Satan wants to, to take away the right words to say so, right? Or to be bold as we do so. He, he wants us to shrink away from the task of evangelism, and that's why Paul, in this very sentence, asks for boldness twice. Twice he asks for boldness. It's not a mistake. Satan is the author of confusion, right? So he would love, when, when, when Paul's 
preaching the gospel that maybe Paul would be filled up with timidity or maybe a lack of clarity, right? Because when the gospel is not clearly presented, there's room for a lot of stuff, right? There's room for confusion. There's room for vagueness. There's room for a lack of conviction. There's room for unnecessary stumbling blocks or aversions to the gospel or even an entirely different gospel altogether, right? There's room for a lot of things to go wrong there. And so we need to pray for preachers and pastors and evangelists as they proclaim the gospel. I mean, every Sunday before I get up here, I'm like, God, just give me the words to say. Just make it make sense to them. It makes sense up here. Sometimes it doesn't make sense coming out, but just use the Holy Spirit to make it make sense, right? Make it be clear. Pray that the Spirit would effectively use our words to bring people to faith and to edify the believers who are there. But I want us to notice this. We, we don't just want to pray for Pauls, right? Which we'll pray for all the Pauls out there, right? We also need to pray for Tychicuses, all right? I had to practice saying that a bunch this morning. That was my vocal exercise. No, uh, but we see in verse 19 and 20 that we are to pray for Pauls, right? All the Pauls out there. If you know Pauls or, or maybe that the Lord would send Pauls, but we should too pray for all the Tychicuses out there in verse 21 and 22. If you read Acts Colossians or the pastoral epistles, you'll see that Tychicus was a man who served with Paul for some time. It's assumed by the way that it's written here that Tychicus was the one who delivered the letter to the churches here in Ephesus. And notice how he's described in verse 21. He's described as a beloved brother and a faithful minister. Now, that has to set off your light bulbs, okay, because Paul's very methodical in how he wrote. So in some of the last verses of the book, He's mirroring language from some of the first verses of the book. If you look at verse, chapter 1, verse 1, Paul addresses the letter to the saints who are in Ephesus who are faithful in Christ Jesus, who three verses later he calls the beloved, right? And so these subtle bookends, what they do is they actually show how Tychicus was fit to serve the body, right? He was, he was a faithful minister, and he was in Christ, well, j- that's just how Paul described the church, the church that Tychicus was sent to. And Paul goes on to list a couple reasons as to why Tychicus was sent. The first was obviously to just supply them with information. How's Paul doing? He's in prison. Have you checked on him? What's going on? So Paul kind of fills them in there. But the second and more important reason that Tychicus is sent is to encourage their hearts. And this is what a great pastor does, right? This is what Paul does. He, he spreads the word and he encourages people right? He spreads the word, and he cares for the people. He encourages the saints. But I want you to notice that Paul is not, he's, he's not a lone ranger, right? He's not this rugged individual out there on his own planting churches by the strength of his own might. Even when he's in custody, he's surrounded by co-laborers. I mean, you read throughout the Old Testament, he's surrounded with guys like Tychicus, Mark, Jesus Justice, Epaphras, Luke, Demas, the list goes on and on and on. And these are people that he's mentored, he's invested in, he's he'd poured into their life, and they have actually enabled him to continue his ministry despite being in chains in a prison cell, right? He can't physically, personally visit all these churches that he's planted, right? He's in jail. But yet he still feels this pastoral responsibility for them, and so he maintains contact with them and keeps up with them prays for them, encourages them, instructs them, corrects them, sends them trusted representatives to also serve them, teach them, encourage them, love them. Now, before we get into verse 23 and 24, I want to just, there's a lot of implications I'm sure I can get in here, but I just want to kind of pull three things about ministry out of this text that I think we can see here. There. I'm kind of pulling them out, right? They're implications from the text. The first one is this. Ministry can't be done alone. Ministry cannot be done alone. One, one pastor can't do it on his own. Robert just taught this. this is, we need a plurality, right? One pastor cannot pastor church by himself. One missionary cannot conquer the mission field by himself or herself. Paul always had a team. Always. In, 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 in churches, we, we need more faithful men to help shepherd the flock. I know a lot of people go, great, you guys have a plurality. You got three people. Cool. I don't need to do anything. No, we, actively, the three of us are always praying, I mean, come help us carry the workload, right? 
We're always praying and asking God, raise up men from within our church to help us in the task of shepherding or bring someone from the outside. Just as when, when, when we needed more pastors here and we needed more leaders here a couple years ago, the Lord sent Jim and Robert who were qualified men with experience ready to just plug and play, right? The Lord can do that. So we need to pray for God to send more men to serve as pastors. And, and if you're a man who is like, pray through, is the Lord calling me to this? Do I aspire to something like that? You should at least aspire to be qualified, right? As a man above reproach, husband of one wife, thought of well by outside. I mean, these are all things, it's just being Christ-like, right? But it's not just for pastors that, that do ministry. Remember chapter four, we equip the saints for the work of ministry, meaning all of you, even those who, who aren't called to being a pastor, all of you have gifts and abilities that would help us in serving the church. And so bring your passions, right? Bring your expertise. You know things about kids or outreach or finance or other things that I am just lost on. Bring that to the table, right? All of us together, Ephesians 4, we're building one another up in love. We're, we're using our gifts, using our abilities, serving one another, giving to one another. Now, kind of going outside of our context, um, there is a need for missionaries, right, across the world. And not just in Paul's day, I would say even today. Today, there are 7,200, 7,200 people groups that have not been reached with the gospel. What does that mean? Okay, what, there's 9 billion people on the planet or something like that? 4.5 billion people don't know Jesus. 4.5 4.5 billion people don't know Jesus, which means each day 155,000 people are dying without saving faith in Jesus. Every day. And so I, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm like, we need to pray that the Lord would have me to be a Paul or a Tychicus or someone, somewhere, something where we bring the gospel or equip people to bring the gospel to the nations. We, we have to be about that. We have to, at minimum, pray that God would help me support the mission work that's going on. Help me send people well, love them well, support them well, encourage them. Maybe I can be a Tychicus to missionaries on the field. Maybe I can just go and encourage them. That, that's what our team, when we go to England in, in August, that's exactly what we're doing. We're going to a church plant that we support, and the number one goal of that is to encourage them and to love them and care for them. Encourage them in the faithful work of ministry. But pray through, go, God, would you have us go? Te- teach your kids this, right? I know a lot of us as parents, we want the American dream for our kids. We want them to get a great education and have an amazing, successful life where they get married and have kids and live the happy, whatever the American dream is. But pray through, God, would you maybe call my children overseas? Bring them to the nations. Like, let them be the beacon of hope with which you bring salvation to the world. That's so much greater in the grand scheme of eternity than anything we can hope for on earth. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, right? But the workers are few. All right, the second thing. Ministry can't be done alone. The second thing is we must have a long-term approach. We have to have a long-term approach. I loved when Matthew preached here a few weeks ago. He said, I have a hundred-year vision. And I'm like, dude, you're no way you're living a hundred more years, right? And that's the point, right? That's the point. We're called to make disciples of all nations, right? We're called to teach them everything Jesus commanded us. And this is a very, 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 very long process. In fact, it'll take your entire life and then eternity after that, right? That's why God gives us eternity with him. This is a long process. It requires relationship building. It requires spiritual development. It's nothing that some magical spell can fix overnight, right? It is a long, arduous process. Notice that Tychicus was sent to encourage the Ephesians and update them with Paul. He wasn't there to build out systems. He wasn't there to go on staff at their church. He wasn't there to go recruit people or fundraise, right? Things that we want to see immediate results. He wasn't there to go have a big revival and then baptize a bunch of people. He wasn't there called to fix their problems or build out efficient systems. He's there to build relationships and love the people and just say, hey, this is what's going on with Paul. That's all he was sent to do. I mean, do, do we have a long-term approach to discipleship? 
Or do we think that, oh, we haven't planted a, a community group in a year or two. What are we even doing, right? Some of the, the best growth I've seen in our church is not the, the quantitative growth, right, but the qualitative growth that I think we've experienced as we've walked four, five, some of you, 10, 12 years with me, that I've seen the Lord do things that he just doesn't happen overnight, right? Are we willing to walk years and years and years with people, even decades with people, even if we see very little progress? I'm not just talking ministry anymore. I'm talking just normal discipleship. Your kids, your spouses, your neighbors, your family members that don't know Jesus. You go, well, we've, we've tried sharing the gospel before. Didn't work. Or are we saying, no, 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 I am until it's too late, which is when? Death, right? Until then, I am devoted and I will be faithful. We're called to be faithful, right? We're not called to be fruitful. The Lord brings the fruit, right? We're called to water. We're called to plant seeds. God will do the growing. We're called to be faithful, not just present results, right? And, and faithfulness isn't always quantifiable by metrics, right? It's not always quantifiable by these results that we can see. Sometimes it may take a whole lifetime to see fruit, and still then we might not see fruit. In fact, I, I, I emailed my pastor growing up when I was a kid, when I was six years old, and I, I realized, okay, I love Jesus. When I was about 12, that's when I realized, I think I want to go into ministry, and I've never told him that. And here I am now pastoring in ministry, doing what I think the Lord's called me to do, that I think he really put that in me under this man's preaching. And so I'm just like, well, I'm sure someone, I would love to get an email like that from someone someday, right? So why did I just send him an email? I just say, hey, thanks for the ways that the Lord used you in my life, right? Because we don't always see the fruit. Even if it's there and it happens and it's legitimate, we're still called to be faithful, all right? All right, have the long-term view. Number three, we are co-laborers, not competitors. Now, I could preach a whole sermon on this. I won't today, maybe next week, no, uh, but because ministry is relational, right, because we're called to invest in other people, we're going to spend a lot of time doing so, right? We're going to spend a lot of time doing so. And I think if we faithfully invest in people, we will send people out, right? If, if I preach missions well enough that it does something in people, hopefully they go on missions, right? If I preach on church planting enough that it does something in someone, the Lord uses that to stir something and then hopefully, prayerfully, they'd plant a church, right? And so if we have the long-term approach to mission, or to, to ministry, what that means is we have to think or plan beyond our own ministry, right? This is everything from succession planning within your own church all the way to church planting or sending missionaries, right? And, and I think underneath that, a truth that I think we have to understand, I'm going to come back to this, God's kingdom is bigger than our church. It has to be. It existed long before this church was ever a church. And when this world is all good and gone, God's kingdom will still be here, right? God's kingdom will still be here. It's, 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 it's good when people are sent. It's sad, sure, yes. Do I miss seeing, like, it's great to have Brian back. I, I miss seeing Brian. I miss spending time with him. If you guys haven't seen Brian yet, go hug Brian and Ellie, right? They're back. It, it was sad when we sent Jake away to Grace Waco to go do college ministry, but that's, that's good. I'm like, this is what we, what we want. We want to find men and women who we can invest in and send out. That's the goal here, right? We're to equip the saints for the work of ministry. I mean, again, I could probably preach a whole sermon or, I don't know, write a book. I don't like writing, but something. But I don't think we need to look any further than Paul's ministry to see this exemplified. I mean, you could look at all those relationships I just mentioned about Paul. Even Mark, who they parted ways on a missionary journey. When Paul is on his deathbed, what does he say? Tell Mark to bring me my coat, right? Now, these are people that we might even have some secondary disagreements with. Baptism, I don't know politics, I, whatever the thing is, right? Like non-gospel truths that I'm like, we agree in Jesus and we can disagree on other things. And, and what Paul says is, I rejoice that Christ is proclaimed. I rejoice that he's proclaimed. I count them as dear friends. And so yes, should we invest in and love people even if they're going to be sent out? Of course we should, 
And then I'm like, well, then the same applies for the church across town, right? The gospel is being preached there. We should love them, even if we don't see eye to eye on how we structure church or how we do service or our view on baptism, right? I, mean, I still have all those convictions. But I think that we should invest in and love and care for and pray for all of the churches around us. I mean, I, I love, I genuinely love, I was reflecting on this the other day, I genuinely love that in Waco, there are so many gospel-centered churches. Whereas when I moved here 10 years ago, there may be a handful to pick from. And now I'm like, you could spend months visiting all the gospel-centered churches in town. And that's why I say at our members meet class, when, when someone comes for a member, I'm like, if this church isn't for you, that's fine. Just tell me, I'll point you to some great churches in town. I'd love for you to be there. I just want you where the gospel is being preached. I love those churches. We pray for them. We care for them. And, and I love, too, that they're all different sizes, different denominations, right? Because God is using all of us as churches in Waco uniquely and collectively to accomplish his mission. Now, I go on and on, but we'll get to the last couple verses. All right, verse 23 and 24. In this benediction, what Paul does is he ends the letter with themes of love, themes of grace, themes of peace. These, these have come up all throughout the book, right? And I think the only reason that Paul can end it and, and really pray this blessing over the people in Ephesus is because he first received these from God. Notice what he's already said so far in the letter. He says, in love, God predestined us for adoption of sons. Because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive in Christ. He's blessed us in the love with his glorious grace. And Paul says in chapter 2, you've been saved by grace through faith. It, right? And so because of this unconditional love, this saving grace, what we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ is that he's given us reconciling peace both to God and to one another. It's amazing. And, and Paul's been over all of this. He's, he's already explained this. He says all of it comes from God. And, he, and, and, and Paul knows that God will give this to all who ask freely. Freely give these to all who ask. And so we should pray blessings for one another, Right? We should pray blessings for one another. I'm not talking material blessings. Don't pray that I get a new Tesla. That would be great. That's not what we're talking about here, right? We're talking that, that I would abound in love, that I would abound in faith, that I would abound in grace, that I would abound in peace. I mean, we, we all know people in our lives or in our families that haven't yet experienced the blessings of God in this way. They don't know the love of God in Christ Jesus. They don't know faith in Him. They don't have the hope. They don't have peace with God or peace with their brothers. They don't have that. And so that should lead us to our knees and, and, and pray that God would bless them with salvation, bless them with Jesus, where they have all these things, right? If, if you're here today and, and you've never been a Christian before, this is not a, a call to condemn you. This is a call to, to ask that, that you would repent of your sins and believe in Jesus. This, this is a call of blessing, Right? Like, come enjoy the free gift of God, the eternal peace. It's, it's incorruptible. It's unending. And when you die, it doesn't leave you. Everything else does. This is the one thing that goes with you beyond the grave. There's nothing more than we want than for you to know Jesus. And if you are in Christ, we, sh we should pray that the Lord strengthens us. Right? In verse 23 and 24, Paul is calling out to God to bring his favor, to bring his help, to bring his assistance to other believers, right? It's, it's, it's not simply enough for Paul to just teach and write on these things. It brings him to prayer. It brings him to worship. It, it brings him to something. He knows these are spiritual gifts that are spiritually imparted and spiritually received. And so here he prays the blessing over the people, and we too should follow this example, right? By, by praying God's blessing over people, especially those who are hurting, especially those who are sick, especially those who are facing spiritual attack. And so if, if we see one thing then in this conclusion of the letter, I'll conclude the sermon, conclude the series, conclude the letter on this, right? If we see one thing here in this conclusion, we have to see how much Paul relied on God, how much he relied on him for everything, everything. This is not just a formality that Paul puts at the end of his letters, right? This isn't just a super spiritual way that a missionary says bye with all these big fancy Christian buzzwords, right? Paul is earnestly asking God to bless the saints in Ephesus. Again, he's in prison, right? 
These people are freely worshiping in churches, going about their lives, and Paul's not consumed with the limitations of his own circumstance, his own imprisonment. He doesn't look inward. He looks upward and he looks outward and, and prays to the Lord for these people that are in his life. He's quick to praise God for all things because he sees God as the source of all good things. And so he prays for those around him while giving glory to God. So my, my prayer for us is that we would do the same, all right? That we'd pray comprehensively to the one who is worthy. Let me pray for us this morning.